this video, we'll be diving deep into system design of YouTube, one of the world's largest video sharing platforms. We'll explore the key technical challenges involved in building and scaling such a massive system from storage and database management to compute capacity and network bandwidth. So without further ado, let's begin. Let's start by asking some clarifying questions first, such as what type of videos will be uploaded in the platform? Will there be any restrictions on the size or length of the videos? How many users are expected to use the platform and how many videos are expected to be uploaded? And how important is the search feature for the platform? As far as our tech and business requirements, let's say the platform should be highly available and scalable to handle a large number of users and videos and that videos should be stored and served efficiently with minimal latency and high throughput. It should also support a search feature that allows users to find relevant videos quickly and accurately. Of course, it should be able to handle large number of concurrent video streams with minimal buffering and should be optimized for mobile devices with a responsive and user-friendly interface. Now in this system design video, I will mainly concentrate on three core functionalities of YouTube, video uploading, search and video playback. Although YouTube has numerous services, I will not be covering topics such as user signups, analytics, monetization and security. Capacity planning is usually optional, but sometimes play an important aspect of system design interviews, such as this one, because it demonstrates the ability of the candidate to think through the scalability requirements of the system being designed. Here is an estimate of the capacity planning for the YouTube system design based on the requirements provided. Now, these are some hypothetical numbers to help you just get started. So let's say the number of users we have is 100 million registered or active users. Now, even though YouTube has over 2 billion users, here we are going with 100 billion. Let's assume the videos with an average size of 100 megabytes each and the expected number of videos watched per day are somewhere around 100 million videos. The expected number of uploads per day, say 1 million videos. The number of concurrent users during peak hours, say 10 million. The average video length we took 10 minutes and the average video size to be 100 MB. Based on these numbers, let's compute the daily storage we need. So total storage required per videos watched would be somewhere around 100 million times 100 megabytes, which comes to 10,000 terabytes. So the total storage required per day for videos uploaded would be around 1 million times 100 megabytes, which is 100 terabytes. Assuming there are three copies of each video for redundancy, the total storage required per day for videos watched would be 10,000 terabytes times three, which is 30,000 terabytes per day or 30 petabytes per day. Similarly, the total storage required per day for videos uploaded would be, this is just for your reference and to give you an idea about amount of data we are dealing with here. Please don't spend too much time with calculations or capacity planning unless your interviewer is asking you to. Rarely in the interview, you will end up doing all these calculations. Let's talk about database storage. When I refer to daily storage required, I was referring to the total storage required for videos that are watched and uploaded on the platform each day, including the redundancy factor, keeping three copies of each video. This is separate from database storage, which would require for storing metadata and other information related to the videos and users on the platform. Assuming each video has metadata that takes up one kilobyte of space, the total metadata storage required per day would be around 100 million into one KB plus one million into one KB, which comes down to 100 GB per day. The videos can be stored in a distributed file system such as HDFS, which can provide reliable and scalable storage for large amounts of data. You can check out my video on MapReduce to understand it more. Alternatively, videos can also be stored in a cloud storage service such as Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage. Now, I have talked about video streaming in one of my previous videos, but let's do some quick calculations. Assuming an average video bitrate of 5 Mbps, we would need at least 50 TBPS of network bandwidth to handle 10 million concurrent users. And finally, let's also talk about compute capacity real quick. In the context of systems like YouTube, compute capacity mainly refers to the ability of system to process and serve video content to users by performing video transcoding. Video transcoding is the process of converting a video from one format or resolution to another. It is necessary because different devices or platforms may require videos on different formats or resolutions to display properly. For example, a user may upload a video in a high resolution format that is not compatible with all the devices or internet speeds. The video needs to be transcoded to a lower resolution or format 
to be viewed on different devices or internet speeds. Transcoding requires a significant amount of computing power and resources, which is why it is related to compute capacity. The more videos that need to be transcoded, the more computing power is required to handle the workload. A system with a larger user base or higher video upload rate will require more compute capacity to handle the transcoding workload. So speaking of the numbers, the number of video transcoding required per day would be somewhere around 1 million videos into 4, assuming there are 4 qualities per video. So in total, we have 4 million videos to be transcoded. So the total compute capacity required per day would be 4 million videos into 10 minutes, which is the average length of the video into 60 seconds into 30 FPS, which is the frames per second into 2.5 gigahertz, assuming we are having a 2.5 gigahertz CPU, which comes down to 18 billion gigahertz seconds. All right, let's start with a simple outline. At a high level, our system designed for YouTube-like platform will have a front-end, a back-end, a blob store, a database, and a CDN. The front-end of the system is responsible for displaying videos to users and handling user interactions such as video playback, like, comments, and uploads. The front-end can be built using React, Angular, or Vue.js and communicates with the back-end using RESTful APIs. Our back-end will comprise of API and several microservices. The backend of the system is responsible for processing user requests such as searching for videos and managing the video storage and transcoding process. The backend can be built using Node.js, Ruby on Rails, Django, and can communicate with the database and video processing systems. The database is responsible for storing metadata about video and user data. This can be a NoSQL database such as MongoDB or Cassandra for storing metadata about videos and user data and a relational database such as MySQL for storing transactional data. The videos will be stored in a distributed file system such as Google Cloud Storage, Amazon S3, or Azure Blob Storage. The videos will be encrypted for security and compressed for efficient streaming. And finally, we'll also have a content delivery network. The CDN will be used to deliver the video content to the user. The CDN will also cache the video content to provide fast and efficient streaming. This can be a CDN like Amazon CloudFront or Akamai. Now, based on these requirements and our high level design, let's talk about all the possible microservices that would work together to provide us the basic desired functionality. We'll have a user microservice, which is responsible for managing user related data and actions, such as user authentication and user profile management. This microservice interact with user database to store and retrieve user data. For example, when a user creates an account on the video platform, the user microservice would handle the user account creation process, including validating the user's email address and password, storing the user information in the user database, and generating a unique user ID. Video uploader microservice would handle video uploads from the user. It would receive the video file, perform some basic validation and transcoding, and store the video in storage service like S3. Video encoder microservice would handle transcoding of videos into different formats and resolutions for playback on different devices. It could use a service like AWS Elastic Transcoder for this purpose. The search engine will be built using Elasticsearch for fast and efficient search. The search engine will use the video metadata stored in the NoSQL database to provide search results. The video catalog service would store metadata about each video such as title, description, tags, and so on. It would also store information about the video's location on the storage service and its different encodings. And it could use a NoSQL database like MongoDB for this purpose. The video streamer microservice would handle video streaming to users. It would retrieve the appropriate video from the storage service and serve it to the user over HTTP. It could use a content delivery network like CloudFront for this purpose. The metadata microservice stores and retrieves the metadata for each video such as title, description, tags, and categories. The metadata can be stored in NoSQL database such as MongoDB or Cassandra for fast and efficient retrieval. And finally, we will also have a video service API which is responsible for managing all video related operations in the video platform. It provides a RESTful API that allows applications to interact with the video platform. And the API will have the following endpoints. An upload endpoint which allows the users to upload videos to the platform. The API receives the video file, performs validating and transcoding, and stores the video in a storage service like S3. Upon successful upload, the API generates metadata for the video and stores it in the video catalog microservice. 
The search endpoint allows users to perform searches for videos on the platform. The API receives search criteria from the client application and sends the search request to the search engine microservice. The API retrieves the video metadata from the video catalog microservice and sends the search results back to the client application. And finally, the streaming endpoint allows the users to stream videos from the platform. This API endpoint receives a request for a video playback and generates a pre-signed URL for the appropriate video encoding. The API sends the pre-signed URL to the client application, which then uses it to stream the video from a storage service. For our database schema, let's go with three databases. Let's start with video metadata database, which will have a table video metadata with columns such as ID, title, description, tags, upload time, status, URL, encoding, and so on. We'll also have a user database with table user and with columns, say ID, name, email, password. And it will also have a relationship that is one user can have many videos as indicated by the foreign key in video metadata table. And finally, let's also have a video catalog database with table video catalog and columns, ID name, description tags, and relationships such as one video can have many catalog entries and one catalog entry can be associated with only one video. And to clarify, the video catalog database is to store information about the available videos in the systems, such as their title, description, and the user who uploaded them. The database also keeps track of the number of views, likes, and dislikes of each video. The purpose of the video catalog database is to provide a quick and easy way to access basic information about the videos without having to query the more complex video metadata database. On the other hand, the video metadata database contains all the information related to the video content, such as the video file location, encoding parameters, resolution, bitrate, and other technical details. This database also keeps track of various versions and renditions of the video that are available for streaming. The purpose of the video metadata database is to provide a centralized repository of all the video related information that can be accessed by different microservices in the system. Here is a more detailed sequence of steps or invocations for the three use cases, which includes all the components we identified earlier. Let's start with uploading a video. So basically the user initiates a video upload from the front end. The front end sends a request to the video uploader microservice to handle the video upload. The video uploader microservice generates a pre-signed URL for the video file and returns it to the front end. The front end uses the pre-signed URL to upload the video file directly to the designated storage location, such as S3 or a file system. Once the upload is complete, the front end sends a notification to the video uploader microservice with the location of the uploaded file using webhooks, which I have covered in detail in my previous video. Basically, when a video upload is complete, the front end generates a JSON payload containing the location of the uploaded file and relevant metadata. The front end sends an HTTP POST request to the webhook endpoint URL provided by the video uploader microservice, including the JSON payload as the request body. The video uploader microservice receives the HTTP POST request and passes the JSON payload to extract the location of the uploaded file and metadata. And then the video uploader microservice sends a request to the video encoder microservice to transcode the video into different formats and resolutions or playback on different devices. The video encoder microservice retrieves the uploaded video file from the designated storage location and performs transcoding. It then stores the encoded videos in the designated storage location. The video uploader microservice sends a request to the video catalog microservice to store metadata about the video such as title, description, tags, and categories, and information about the video's location in the designated storage location and its different encodings in the video catalog database. The video catalog microservice stores the metadata in video catalog database and retrieves the video file and encoded videos from the designated storage location to gather the necessary information for metadata creation. The metadata service stores and retrieves the metadata for each video such as title, description, tags, and categories in the video metadata database. It is triggered by the video catalog microservice after metadata creation. The video uploader microservice finally sends a notification to the front end that the upload is complete and provides a link to the uploaded video for the users to view or share. For our second use case performing a search, the user initiates a search request by typing in keywords or selecting search criteria on the front end UI. The front end UI sends the search request to the search engine microservice. 
The search engine microservice uses Elasticsearch to search for relevant videos based on search criteria. The search engine microservice retrieves the video IDs of the matching videos from Elasticsearch. The search engine microservice sends the video IDs to the video catalog microservice. The video catalog microservice retrieves the metadata for the videos from the video database. The video catalog microservice sends the metadata for the matching videos back to the search engine microservice. And then the search engine microservice aggregates the metadata and sends the search results back to the front end UI. The front end UI displays the search to the user. And finally, our third use case playing a video, wherein the user selects a video to play from the video catalog displayed on the UI. UI sends a request to the video service API with the ID of the video to be displayed. The video service API retrieves the video metadata from the video catalog microservice, including the location of the video on the storage service and its different encodings. The video service API generates a pre-signed URL for the appropriate video encoding from the storage service such as Google File Systems or S3 and returns it to the UI. The UI uses a pre-signed URL to request the video stream from the video streamer microservice. The video streamer microservice retrieves the appropriate video from the storage service and serves it to the user over HTTP. And finally, the user watches the video on the UI. Note that some of the microservices such as the metadata service may have their own database or metadata service. And these invocations are included in the sequence of steps above. Additionally, the sequence of steps for each use case includes all of the 11 components identified. And since we are in system design interview, let's also talk about some optimization techniques which I haven't included for simplicity's sake. So for example, load balancing can be used to distribute user requests across multiple backend servers to improve system scalability and reliability. This can be achieved using tools such as Nginx or Amazon ELB. You can also have rate limiting that can be used to prevent abuse and improve system performance by limiting the number of requests a user can make per unit of time. Caching can be used to improve performance of the system by reducing the number of requests to the backend. For example, caching the results of frequently using search queries can significantly improve the search performance of the system. Compression can be used to reduce the size of video files and other data transmitted over the network, improving the overall system performance and reducing network usage costs. In conclusion, I hope this video has provided you with a solid foundation for designing a video platform system at a large scale. And if you have any specific system in mind that you would like me to design, please let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching.